Good evening class. Today we're going to go over Chapter 9 Operating Systems in the slide for lecture. And the reason why we went to Chapter 9, uh, back to Chapter 9, was because we I had misplaced those slides. So let's get back into it and talk about operating systems. So today we're going to learn about what an OS is, an operating system, and the different types of operating systems, and their major functions, and then how they manage processes. And as we go through these lectures, I will do my best to point out what will be important and what will be most likely on the tests. So we want to talk about how the OS manages the resources. And when it says resources, that means resources within the computer, generally the RAM, recovering RAM, cache memory, and to some extent hard drives. We're going to talk about how they provide security which is, of course, important in today's day and age, especially when we look at uh, access to files and in lieu of people being able to get in and to uh, hack in and get into our file system. And we're going to talk about file management somewhat in Windows and Linux. So what do we need to know about operating systems? Well, operating systems are really essential to a computer. Without an operating system, you have a big hunk of metal sitting there doing absolutely nothing. Um, without an operating system, you probably could turn your computer, uh, computer on excuse me, and, and post, but then it will come up with a message, no operating system found. So the operating system's main objective is to provide you uh, an interface, so to speak, down to the hardware to use the moving components of the computer, be it the hard drive, any external information, keyboard, monitor, mouse, and to let, uh, let you use the computer in such a way that it will be a benefit to everybody. And also knowing about this is going to improve some efficiency in using your computer. Hopefully this will be a high level overview. We'll give you at least some idea if you do have some problems where to look at in the operating system. So what is an OS? Well, the OS is really the heartbeat of the computer. If the CPU is the brain, the OS is the heartbeat. It keeps things moving. It allows you to interface with the computer, um, such as what we're doing right now um, through this streaming operation. It gives system resources like memory management, hard drives, any external interfaces, and outputs as well, such as to the monitor or to a printer. And so what it does is it controls everything. And it starts out when it's loaded up. So initially when it loads up, it loads the core of the operating system. So that's what happens when you turn on the computer and you see a couple of things move by. And if you're using a Windows operating system, you see that logo come up. You might see a pulsate. Or if you have like a Linux system, you'll see a whole bunch of messages stream by on the command line. And what it's doing at that time is it's loading up the core into memory. And it needs to load it up into memory because the core operating system is essential uh, in inter you know establishing all the interfaces and on top of that it's also essential it's in memory that it's fast enough if it had to continually load from memory or excuse me from the hard drive it would just not be a pleasant experience it would take way too long for old timers out there like myself we used to have an operating system called DOS disk operating system that booted up relatively quickly but it was kind of limited in the scope of what it could do so now we have these complex operating systems like Windows 10, uh, Linux, Macintosh that provide a nicer user experience but on top of that it also has to reside in memory and because of that the requirements for more memory in the computer. So that's why with like Windows 10 operating system it usually requires around 2 gig of RAM and that's why it re is resident in the main memory. So once the core is loaded then it loads and supervises everything else that's happening within the computer. It is what talks to the hard drive and to the bus. It's what fetches the instructions from the CPU or from memory in order to work. So something as simple as moving my mouse here, uh, something that uh, like scrolling, if I was to change into a different software, all of that's being handled by the operating system. Now we take that for granted now because it's become so commonplace, but behind the scenes it's doing quite a bit of work. Most operating systems now are multi-threaded, which allow them to, to do more than one operation at a time. 
And some operating systems are pretty good now at uh, doing what they call a prefetch on instructions to allow you to uh, work a little bit more efficiently. Meaning that it says, well, if they're working in this space, we can load up some of these programs into memory where they're readily available. And it gives, uh, like I said, interface to the CPU and I.O. And generally these are written in C and C++. And the reason why, as we get into the programming module, is because C and C++ are closer to the metal, meaning that there's less interface going through and less translation. Now, some operating systems uh, that work on, say, Android, um, do have C and C++, but some of their interface and some of their loading modules is done in Java. So let's take a look here at this slide. So as you can see here, we have the hardware layer. And the hardware layer here is all the physical components within your drive, or in your CPU, excuse me, such as RAM, hard drive, the BIOS here, we'll talk about that in a second, and external devices like a printer. Well, all of these really are useless without this operating system layer right here. The operating system is what the user uses to access this, and that's what application software uses to access all the hardware layer. Applications generally do not go directly into the hardware layer because they have to go through the operating system because the operating system is what manages all of the uh, man uh, memory management and loading and unloading. So you don't necessarily want an application to go past the operating system because that can cause some problems. So as we talked about here, the core program loaded into the BIOS is the kernel. So this is loaded by the BIOS right here. This is ROM. Remember, ROM is read-only memory. The BIOS is the basic input-output system. What's contained in the ROM, which is in there and cannot usually cannot be updated, is what hard drive is available, which RAM is available, all the addresses, etc. It also knows in the hard drive where the boot sectors are to start to fetch the initial loading of the operating system. So when you turn the computer on, the ROM BIOS actually comes up first, make sure that all the hardware is available, then it fetches the operating system down into the CPU and into RAM and gets it ready to run. The important thing to know, and that was probably on the quiz or on the final, is that it remains in memory the entire time the computer is on. However, it's in RAM memory, so if you turn the computer off, then that operating system's gone. And that's why it's really, really bad to just turn your, hard, your hardware off without shutting down an operating system, because even though it looks like you're not doing anything and you say to yourself, well, you know, at this point, I think I'm just going to go ahead and uh, turn the computer off. It doesn't look like it's doing anything. If you look in the background, it's always doing something. It's doing memory management. It's loading in modules that are always working, and it's switching between tasks. So if we come into here real quick, and we look at the task manager here, and you can see at this point, there's actually two different programs running, Chrome and OBS Studio, which I am recording on. But look at this. So if I come out here, and look at this, I've got these apps that are running, but you'll notice down here, if I change it by memory, you'll notice that Chrome's taking up some memory, but here's Skype, here's IQ, here's Cortana, here's Explore. You'll notice that all of these systems here are, are in use. Now let's come out here and take a look at the CPU. You're going to notice here that system interrupts are running and audio device managers. All of these tasks, if you notice, they're shifting around constantly. This is what the operating system is keeping track of and giving time slices to. So that if you just go in and turn this off, you could be in the part of a critical operation. And as a result, then what happens? is you get corrupted data. So always remember, just shut down your operating system. So your models, modules here can give you uh, user interface and device interface. So Windows gives us the graphical user desktop, which is what I'm recording this on right now. Linux has all kinds of different desktops. We have here GNOME, KDE, XFCE, and etc. And people can, with Linux, it's easier to build their operating, or excuse me, their GUIs on there because it's a little bit more open source.
Now, the one thing that it does give us is driver interface with I.O. devices. Remember, I.O. devices are input-output devices. So now, in today's day and age, if you get a new printer, and let's say it's a Wi-Fi printer, you plug it into your Wi-Fi, and then you go out and discover the printers, and uh, the operating system is responsible for loading up the modules to grab the printer, and it goes out and it notices the printer out there on the Wi-Fi, and it's also now smart enough to go out and say you need drivers and install those drivers for you. You don't have to do that anymore manually like you had to in the old days. Now all you have to do is usually is what they call plug and play, and the operating system handles that. It goes out and it finds interrupts that are available, and it provides the interface so that you don't have to worry about it. So now when you plug in a new hard drive, for instance, or a new peripheral device, it's a lot easier than it used to be. And that's what the operating system does. So you'll notice here that it's loaded onto the hard drive, or a ROM chip, if you can. Um, and so where that, where that usually moves to now is they, there is ROM chips, but hard drives, the spinning platters, as we've talked about before, going away and what you really now have is what they call solid state drives SSDs which are a lot faster. For instance the computer I'm working on right now can boot up Windows in about six seconds. Uh, it used to be that it loaded up the operating system before it used to take minutes which it can be an eternity in computer system. So let's take a look at this here. Again here's our hardware layer. This is abstracted from the user even though I'm physically touching the mouse here or looking at the monitor or listening or recording. I am doing that through the operating system. I am not going directly to the hardware. Even with the monitor, or excuse me, with the keyboard and the mouse, even though I'm physically using those, I'm not even touching these. I'm still getting the interaction with that when I hit a button. It goes through the operating system. It does not go direct. The operating system has the tools. It generally has what they call the kernel. Remember the kernel here? Oops, that's kind of odd. The kernel here is what's loaded into memory. It's the core of the operating system. And then on top of that, you generally have a shell. Now, a shell could be Windows 10. It could be KDE. It could be my, uh, the uh, Macintosh OS. So there are two pieces. Linux is more flexible. Linux will give you a kernel, but you can put your own shell on top of it. But you'll notice on the shell, which is what I see around here, is user interface tools. Tools that could be, for instance, a word processor program or programming uh, tools in order to manipulate the computer. I'm still doing that through the operating system. And then there's configuration data over here. Windows still uses the registry, although they're going away from that because it is a good place for hackers to get into. And there are what they call configuration files. Configuration files are a lot of times just plain text files that set up uh, what the, the program's going to do on startup. It used to be called INI files or initialization files. And they've moved away from that. It used to uh, it moved into XML. And now a lot of configuration files are in JSON files and so those are loaded up and based on the settings in there you can tell the, the the shell how to load a user interface. So what's an OS? Microsoft Windows 10 uh, is most widely used still but it is coming uh, into uh, almost a tie here with Linux. And Linux is becoming more popular because we're Windows is 2 gig to load up and to use this operating system. Linux is a little bit more lightweight. In fact, they have Linux systems that like we talked about that can load on an IoT chip. Uh, for instance, a Raspberry Pi, which is not a very powerful com computer, can run it. There's another one out there called Onion, which is about the size of two postage stamps together, and it runs a complete Linux operating system on it. Now, granted, they don't have a GUI, but still, um, they're becoming, like it says here, popular on smaller IoT devices, and that again because it's lightweight. Uh, the interesting thing about Mac is that it is an alternative to Windows, but it is still running a Linux core. So they took a copy of Linux and they put their OS on that, or their um, GUI on top of that, or their shell on top of that, and that's what you use to interface with the computer. So. A couple other things here is the OS is on a computer, 
It's called the platform. What platform are you running? You may hear that term used. Well, what platform? Well, it's a Windows platform. It's a, a Linux platform. But a couple of things that are interesting that have really, this is starting, OS is fitted for a particular CPU. That is becoming less and less of a mainstay. It used to be that Windows could only run on an Intel or an AMD operating system. However, Windows does have a, a version that will run on a Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is not using an Intel system, and so they've been able to modify that. The same thing with Linux. Linux is able to run on multiple systems, like it talks about here, cross-platform. And that's what Linux really has a strong following for, is because it is not only more lightweight, but it's more uh, flexible to run on multiple platforms. So let's take a quick look here at the history of operating systems. Now, there's some on here that aren't listed. These are the major ones. Unix came about in 1968. The big thing about Linux here is it was multi-user and multitasking OS, and it was used for mid-range computers. Remember back to our history, those are the mainframe computers, not our desktop computers like we see today. Unix is a uh, very strong, powerful language, but it has since really been replaced by Linux. Um, Linux is now running a lot of the um, mid frames um, and uh, systems. There was a question on one of our assignments a while ago that asked which operating system was the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ running, and those were running on Linux. So when we don't see Linux up here, we do see Unix, which is pretty close. 1975, out came CPM, and this worked on our first desktop PC, personal computer. Uh, its big thing to know was VisiCalc. VisiCalc was the first killer app, so to speak, because it made this giant lump of metal that everybody had or seen into something usable. VisiCalc has uh, since died and has moved on with uh, either like Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel. And then around 1980, um, MS-DOS came out. MS-DOS was written by Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates and his partner. And um, at that time, IBM, they needed to have a way to get this personal computer they just had out on the market to be usable. And so Bill Gates and his partners came together with MS-DOS uh, version 1.0 stuck a disk in a floppy disk in and you booted it up and after it posted from the ROM then you got what they call the C prompt and that operating system lo system loaded allow you to get to the hard drive the A drive B drives which were the floppies copy files load programs etc it's rudimentary but it worked and it was fairly inexpensive IBM, to cover their bases, also came out with another one called PC-DOS, which really didn't last that long. Um, MS-DOS at that time was starting to gain speed, and they decided instead of supporting two versions of operating system, they would just go with one, which is MS-DOS. Then you'll notice in 1984, Mac OS came out. Now, Mac OS was a little bit different. Before the Mac, you had like the Apple IIe, and it booted up, had a similar type of operating system to CPM and MS-DOS. In fact, I believe CPM uh, was what was running. And what my Mac did is it kind of ushered in the age of the GUI, or the graphical user interface. It allows us to use the thing called a mouse, which we take for granted now. It allowed uh, just icons on the screen for files, and it became so much easier to use a computer at that time. Now, it was only uh, running on com uh, Apple computers, and it was fairly expensive, and uh, people still stayed with the PC because it was uh, Apple was a little bit more closed, where DOS was a little bit more open, so it was easier to develop games and, and applications in MS-DOS versus for the Mac. But still, at that point, Mac took that, and they actually didn't develop it from scratch. Just interesting to know. They took it from a company that we're all familiar with called Xerox. Xerox is the first GUI, really, and that used the mouse. And, and um, Apple borrowed from that and used it, which I thought was interesting. So a couple more operating systems here. Uh, so Microsoft saw the writing on the wall said, look, we can't just stay with the command line. 
and so they created Windows 3.x, which was 3.0 to begin with, and then 3.1, and 3.1.1, and then 3.1.1 for uh, work groups. And it put a, a pretty picture on top of DOS, and it was kind of like the Mac, um, but it allowed the users uh, to use their PC a little bit more efficiently. Um, programs could run in Windows or in DOS, and um, that that Windows, even under the covers, it was DOS, it still allowed for a little bit more usability. So then Linux came around in 1990. Linux is an open source uh, OS started by a man named Linus Travalis, and he bought a PC, and he was upset that he just laid out a huge amount of cash for it, and then all of a sudden he had to pay even more money to have this operating system. So he used some of the open source community and he decided that he was going to base it off of Unix type commands and by doing so he created Linux. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this up just a little bit for us here. Hopefully this is a little bit easier to, to read. So like we talked about before, Linux does not have a dedicated uh, GUI for it like Windows or for Mac OS. There are all kinds of GUIs and, and people would take this open source and they would take it and modify it to use what they needed and add to it and remove things that they didn't need and use all kinds of different GUIs that suited them the best. And because it was open source, it kind of got a little bit of traction and now it has exploded. Microsoft used to be completely anti-Linux and thought it as an enemy but now they look at it as a friend and now you can get the Windows uh, Linux subsystem and again the Mac OS is a Linux core and so with it being a public uh, open source it's free. Now when we say free that doesn't necessarily mean you can go out and get Win or Mac for free um, but what that means is you can get a copy of Linux for free and use it um, but generally it doesn't come with a lot of support. After that in uh, 93 Windows NT uh, came out and, and NT by the way stands for new technology and it really became more of pulling it from the desktop and NT kind of more went into the server based software and they did have NT workstations for end users but mostly NT was used for managing networks um, and for running businesses and it was a little bit more technical it had more uh, networking in there it had more configuration and it was actually a, a lot uh, more open and it was although in a core of DOS there was a lot more around it uh, specifically as we talked about remember in file systems it went from the file or from the fat into NTFS and remember NTFS is what provided security up to that point Windows 3.x didn't have security do you remember talking we talked about that in a couple of lectures ago anybody can get into any folder and now with Windows NT they put on a layer of security from that then of course Windows 95 came out, uh, 98, ME, etc. It's interesting to know it relied on a DOS core. However, it had more advanced features in it that went from DOS. So we got things like plug and play, which we kind of take advantage of now. Um, integra integrated uh, internet, which is something that we take for granted now. And it had a wider support for DVDs, CDs, etc. At this point with Windows 95, people were not having to go out to MS-DOS anymore like they did with Windows 3.1 in order to have to modify uh, memory usage uh, because M Windows 95 was managing that for it. Still 32-bit. Windows 95, or excuse me, Windows NT went to Windows 2000. A lot of different layers came into 2000 especially for speed and stability. At this point, Microsoft realized that Linux was now becoming powerhouse when it came to running enterprise software. And so they came out with Windows 2000, and they uh, kind of at this point they had different versions. They had Windows 2000 Server, Advanced Server, they had a data center, etc. All of these had specialized pieces in it to help enterprise software become a little bit more uh, stable than on Windows NT. And of course Windows XP, which is 2001, this is where they really kind of shed the last of the DOS. And this is where it was an integrated interface, uh, better performance, better uh, 
uh, audio, visual, and there were different versions of it. And then we talk about Windows Server 2003. It was more of networking. Again, more layers added upon it. They had different editions. And then Vista, which we don't talk about. Vista was a mitigated disaster. Came out a little bit too early. Um, was a little bit too heavy-handed when it came out to uh, security. And it really didn't do that well. Um, as it says, the release was delayed because the extra rig required for the security aspects of the OS. And then Windows 7, which was a really good release of Windows, came out. And between Windows 7 and Windows 10, which is running now, there's been some others that have, have been released. But, you know, Windows 7 was a very good operating system, and Windows 10 is as well. And a lot of people have gone to Windows 10. Just to let you know, at the time of this recording, Windows 7 is no longer supported by Microsoft at all, meaning there are still bugs and there are still zero-day exploits out there. People running Windows 7 now have no support from Microsoft. So let's talk about different types of, of operating systems and features. So let's talk about Windows 3X and DOS. Now, they're lumped together because Windows 3X was really DOS in a pretty package. It was a single task. It was a problem. The problem was is that you can only run one task at a time. And for those of you who used to run the old Windows 3.1, you can launch a program. And while it's running, if you try to do anything else, it looked like the operating system froze. And it was really bothersome. Now, just step back here. There was another OS that came out about the time that Windows 3X, um, right before Windows 95 in the mid-90 range here, uh, operating system that came out from IBM called OS2 Warp. Now OS2, well, or IBM and OS2, was working in conjunction with Microsoft. And Microsoft decided that they wanted to take their own operating system off in one direction. And so part of their agreement is they had to continue to share some resources. And as a result, OS2 Warp came out. OS2 Warp was a multitasking, really hardcore, it was a great operating system. It just never really caught on for one reason or another. And a lot of people use DOS. So, again, the limitations of operating systems and larger and larger programs required that we needed to have some multitasking. So, Windows, starting in Windows 95, Linux and Mac, and it's interesting to note Linux, which was based on Unix, had always supported multitasking, allowed more than one process to run at a time. And those were allowed to have multiple users and multiple programs, and it really, you could see a major difference between a single tasking versus multitasking. Now, everything's multitasking. Even the smallest IoT devices have multiple cores. It's, a, it's quite amazing how we've been able to come past that single tasking into multitasking tasking. There were some network operating systems out there, NetWare, Unix, Linux, and Server 2008, and these are strong network services. These were really kind of geared towards the networking aspect. NetWare came out uh, since died. Unix has been along since 1968, and is again great for networking, facilitated fast transfers. A lot of the backbone for the internet is running on Linux servers dedicated to operating systems traffic redirection remember as we talked about TCP IP DNS etc it's really good it's really geared towards getting that information where it needs to go to uh, quickly so most of you uh, will probably not run into that operating system unless you get into uh, the systems uh, or you decide you want to be a sysdev or a network engineer then you might get into those. Uh, interesting to note Cisco routers which are what is used a lot to switch network packets as we talked about usually has a Linux subsystem running on it that is just dedicated again to network operating systems. So we have multi-processing and this can allow the execution of a process using two or more CPUs at the same time. Now when it says CPUs now, just think of cores. So the multiprocessing, which is not the same as multitasking, multiprocessing allows a multiple core application to execute a single process, where multitasking allows more than one process to run at a time on a CPU. So the difference there is the CPU will do time slicing, we'll talk about this, and allowing programs to run at small intervals, 
multiprocessing can take a single process and spread it out among different CPUs or cores and make that single process run even faster. So Windows and Mac appeal really to the home user and I'm also put in here even though it says Linux here Linux is also appealing to the home users more and more especially when you get into the Linux develop or IOT development uh, Linux is becoming very popular uh, for instance the type of Linux running on Chrome uh, which is Chrome OS um, and then of course all of your smart devices are running in a Linux system Unix is all but dead except for some very specialized applications but Linux has great multitasking and excellent security. That's what it was built for. It's stable. It's stable because it doesn't have to maintain a huge GUI on top of everything. All it has to do is take that uh, information and route it to the right areas. It doesn't have to worry about updating screens and resolutions a lot of the time. It's very good for being stable. For being able to be clustered easily. Now granted Windows can do that as well but Linux and Unix really came out of the gate strong in these areas and that's why they have uh, server environment operating systems. Again like we talked about NASDAQ a lot of the heavy companies are running Linux systems. In my line of work more and more development is getting uh, towards Linux systems that are doing nothing more than just sitting out there and listening for messages and processing them. So we don't need all the overhead of the GUI but we do get the stability of Linux. There are other uh, OS's, there's these things that used to call PDAs, which is public digital assistance, which are all but dead now. Uh, and of course cell phones as we talked about. So let's talk about some functions of the OS. Really the basic function number one, it needs to provide a user interface. Whether that's a command line so you can type in commands like Linux is really good at, or whether it's a GUI like Macintosh or Windows, it still gives a user interface some way for us to use our keyboard and any other device to be able to make our computer do something. It also schedules and manages program execution. Now when it says schedule here, don't think of like putting it on the calendar. What the operating system does, and as we looked about when we were out here on our right here, see this CPU here? So if we come out here to our performance, you can see here that we have this CPU here. And you see it's got 300 and 3,500 threads, and here's the processes. And you'll notice here that it's got eight cores. So there are eight cores running on this out here. But you can see all the CPU activity, and all of these are right now 3,500 threads, and they're all sharing these cores. And so the operating system sits behind, and it manages or schedules these, uh, these programs to run. And it's done in milliseconds, so it's saying, now you get some processing time, and you get some processing time. That's what it means by scheduling and managing the program execution. It manages memory which means that when a program needs to be loaded into memory it's loaded and when it needs to be unloaded from memory it reclaims that memory and allows that memory to be available for other programs you don't have to do that that's what the operating system does it configures devices again plug and play when it first came out we called it plug and pray because a lot of times you'd plug it in and it wasn't identified and there were a lot of problems and now it's almost like we take it for granted so, for instance, cover, uh, configuring a device, if we have a Wi-Fi device and we hook up to someone's Wi-Fi now, we can get their username password, we log on. We don't have to worry about configuring, you know, whether it's a 802.11g and what's the frequency, what's the security. All of that is now handled by the operating system negotiating with the Wi-Fi router. We don't have to worry about that anymore. The big thing it does is file management and security. I mean, what do we use computers for? Well, we use computers for a lot of things. But a lot of things that we use, for instance, taking photographs or writing papers or doing schoolwork, we're going to save it as a file somewhere. Very few people I know use a computer and don't save the file. So it provides file management. It gives you a structure in which to save your files. It allows you to copy and rename and delete and move files without having to worry about how it's done. Back in the old day, DOS days, to, to move a directory from one location to another was a nightmare. And we had a utility called xcopy, which was great, but before that you had to create the structure and move those folders over one by one, but you had to create a new file structure and then you had to move the files over. It was a nightmare. And now it's simple as drag and drop.
and then with networking capability. I don't think any of us worry about networking. We generally do Wi-Fi, or if not, we plug in the Cat5 cable in the back. Negotiations handled for us, and we're able to use network relatively easy. In the good old days when I was doing this back in the late 90s, when we put a network card in, we had to configure it was at 10 base T, 10 base 100. We had to set up the packets. We had to set up all kinds of uh, settings, and it was just it was horrible. And now. A lot of it is you go into Wi-Fi, or if not, you plug it in, and it configures everything for you. So it doesn't not just give you basic network capability. It gives you real network capability. And this networking also includes going out to the Internet. We take it again, take it for granted to hit out to the web to get on the Internet, because it's just there for us now. It's been integrated. Now another thing in here is monitoring performance. Let's come back over here pop up our performance monitor and you'll see here here's our performance and you can see here this is the CPU activity and it's relatively low you can here see here it manages memory and the disks and Wi-Fi look at our Wi-Fi here here's our throughput all of this is being man managed here's the GPU for this computer uh, it's a G4 GTX 1080 but you'll notice that here's the 3D and the encode all of this is being managed for me and so what happens is if we notice there's a slowdown in performance the operating system will t try to take steps in order to increase the performance whether that's unloading some unnecessary files or you know taking some steps in rescheduling program execution so let's talk about the four main categories here that we're we're going to go through. We've got a UI. We know what the UI is. We've talked about it. We've talked about managing processes. Processes that are going on that are you are currently using, as well as processes that are going on in the background, like garbage collection, which is reclaiming memory, or disk allocation, or monitoring of the network. All of that is going on, and it manages those processes. And on top of that, it manages the resources, like memory, like disk space, like network throughput. All of that is managed through the OS. And then the big one that we should all be really worried about is security. Now security, again, we're almost taking granted for it that I can right click on a file and I could say, I don't want anybody but this person to see this file. Before in Windows 3, uh, 3.x, you didn't have that capability. So you're able to provide a, a bit more secure. And I think at this point, Windows and Mac are starting to catch up to Linux in a, in a pretty reasonable fashion. Let's go over these real quick. We talked about them before. The user interface is, you know, what you use to talk to the computer and what the computer uses to talk to you. There are command line or CLI interfaces uh, like DOS and Linux, and you can still get in to a console here in Windows 10. Um, and that's what it says here is a console operating system. I think it's interesting that for the longest time the OS, OS GUI was everything. Windows 95 came out, it was revolutionary, everybody's all excited about it. And now it's getting back to the point that there's a lot of processing that goes on that we don't need a large OS or a GUI for. And so now we're going back to writing what they call console applications that don't require all the overhead of loading up, you know, frames and windows and buttons, etc and going back to using just the command line like Windows services to just process files. It's kind of interesting how it's all come back. And that's with the command line interface. Everything's typed in by hand in a DOS prompt uh, or the command prompt. So our GUI here, we're ve all of us are familiar with GUI. We don't have to go spend a lot of time on this. We double click on an icon or single click on an icon and it takes some action. Whether we're opening a file, whether we're running Windows 90, or excuse me, Internet Explorer or Chrome or whether we're executing a program, now we use the mouse to really interact with the computer. We drop down menus, we can make selections. This is how a GUI works. We, we're all pretty familiar with it. On a phone, we don't necessarily have a mouse. We use our fingers to scroll and touch and drag, etc. All of that is the GUI. So let's get a lovely picture here of some old, you know, Windows 95 GUI. So on the top here, this is DOS. Okay, this is it's and it's interesting to me that this has come back full circle because this is a console application. Notice it says command prompt. This is what a lot of programs are going for that don't require user input for. There's no reason to load all of the overhead for this when this will do. 
Now at the bottom, this is Windows Vista, which is not a good operating system. But you see it looks a lot like Windows 10. You got a start button here, but all of this, all of these applications, any of the monitoring down here, all the files and icons, all of this has to be managed by the operating system. That takes CPU cycles, and therefore that takes a lot of time away from processing if you were going to do this, for instance, on a command line. But for 99% of the work that we do on our computers, for those of us who are using Windows or Mac, this is what we're used to. And it is efficient, and we become uh, accustomed to it. And looking at the icons and the grouping of programs here and setting up customization and configuration. And then, of course, here, this is a Linux interface. And this looks like Ubuntu. And notice how it looks really similar to the Windows slash Mac interface. And that's because um, that's what people are used to seeing. But in this case, you'll notice up here that instead of being on the bottom, like here on Windows, it's up here on the top. There's some different similarities, but you'll notice here's the max, min buttons, and the close button. And the file system here has these folder icons and file icons. So a couple other things is we have the command prompt for Windows. Um, and it can give you... Uh, a DOS environment. It also has in Windows, just to let you know, uh, they're moving to either the Linux PowerShell, uh, or excuse me, the Linux uh, command or PowerShell command, which gives you a lot more power in the command line doing a lot of batch programming without having to load the interface. And it does provide some backwards compatibility. It says here that a GUI can be added to Linux, but a lot of times Linux doesn't need a GUI because that's not what it's used for. It's just going to be maybe throwing up some windows to scroll past processing notifications. Just know that GUIs for Linux, you can write your own if you want because it's open source, or you can go out and decide which flavor of Unix, as I said, whether Raspbian or Ubuntu or Debian, etc., and they usually have a, a GUI that comes with them. Let's talk about managing processes real quick. So some of the things that it does is it will load, start, supervise, and stop a process. I mean, that really says it all. It loads the program. So when you double click on an icon, the operating system goes out and says, OK, this is the location of the file on the drive. It starts loading up that drive, and it starts executing the commands on the startup. So the program's going to tell the operating system, I need these resources, I need the access to here, here's my uh, security, etc. And starts the program. Once the program's up and running, it supervises the program. It makes sure that it's running okay, that it has access to the memory it needs, and to the OS and the I.O. And if there's a problem, say for instance it stops running or gets hung, the operating system can notify you and says, hey, this, you know, program stopped working, what do you want to do with it? And then when you click the icon, either exit or escape or however you get out of it, it stops the process, meaning that it unloads it from memory, reclaims the memory, and does any cleanup that the program requires when it's saying it stops. So a process is a program that runs on the computer. And a process can spawn or start another process to support them, and they often do. Very rarely now does a program not start that doesn't require extra processes that are also required for that particular program. It just tells the operating system, the operating system goes out, loads those processes and makes them available so that it knows what's going on. Now the task manager, we looked at that, hitting control, alt, delete, gives you some access to what's going on. You can kill a task. Uh, in Linux, you can actually use the kill command, but you can use the ps command. Uh, but here's the thing, DOS has no way to see that. Now, now DOS is all but dead, really. I mean, if you're still running on a DOS computer, you're on your own. But the task manager allows you to see what's going on. So if you have a real long running program, or for, for some reason a program seems to have hung, you can generally go into the task manager, right click, and kill the, the process. In Linux, you can use the kill command. So here's an old task manager. We don't have to go over this too much. I already showed a demo on this. But you can see here the image names and who's running it. This is important. This is part of security. Who's running this? And generally when you're running it here on the process, it's going to come out here. And if I change this, it would tell you who was running this. So let's if we come out here and we look at this, we can see 
that these are all the subsystems that are running and you'll notice that one of those is the console window so this thing in order to run needed the console window I don't have a console window open down here but it uses that in the background as well as using a program called FFmpeg for the conversion of all this video but all of that was needed running this software told the OS the OS said hey you know what I need FFmpeg I need a command line I need these things the operating system said okay I'll gladly oblige and load them up and get them ready for them so you can click on one of these and hit M process now uh, I just want you to be aware that if you're doing that from here, you have to be cautious because if you click on this, uh, this one right here, for instance, and then you hit end process, you're kind of killing that process. You're not allowing that program to gracefully exit. A lot of times it will just stop what it's doing. If you're in a long running process or there's something going on that the program's doing, it's going to kill it and possibly cause some corruption. So just be cautious. This should be a last resort. And then down here, this is the Linux command. So we run ps, and you'll come out here, and you'll see that this one's running bash and ps. It gives a PID. This is a, the, a personal identification number. So if you wanted to, you can come out and run the kill command and give it a PID, and you could kill this. This is, again, running Ubuntu. So let's talk about different processes here. So it says a CPU only one will run one process at a time. So the von Neumann architecture supports serial execution, which means one instruction, one program per cycle. That is highly inefficient. And so what we needed to do is we needed to be able to find out a way for multiple programs to run on the CPU and allow it to be what they call multi-threaded or multi-task. So a CPU will allow extra instructions because it executes, remember, billions of times per second. If we go back to that animation we talked to a long time ago, every clock cycle pulsed or turned on the, those uh, circuits billions of times a second. Well, memory, keyboard, monitor, network, mouse, everything that needs what they call an interrupt will get their processing, but not every single, you know, um, CPU cycle is going to be taken. So there is a lot of extra CPU cycles that can be used to allow parts of a program to run during those execution. And so what it will do is it will multitask that while it's waiting for those CPU cycles. It comes through and it says, oh wow, we got some CPU cycles. Let's go out and grab portions of these programs and use part of these cycles to execute part of this programming. And it does that through a couple of ways, time slicing. So a time slice allows these processes to share the CPU by getting uh, just a small slice. Now, when it says a small slice here, we're talking milliseconds, but again, this is happening billions of times a second. So it's happening to the point where we as humans do not notice. So when we say multitasking here, and that's particularly what we're after again, is the multitasking is it appears that those programs are running simultaneously when in fact they're not. They're all running individually, but they're doing it so fast it appears to be that way. So that's why it gives the illusion of simultaneous execution. And again, because you have different uh, uh, devices and you have uh, now different cores, which we'll talk about in a minute, this time slicing is really uh, was an effective way to allow those idle CPU time to be used for something else. Um, it is all managed by the OS and it is very complicated. It does this with interrupts. And now this is important because this is in the test. Interrupt handling is just like a little kid. Okay, so if the CPU was the parent. What an interrupt is, is like you're having a conversation with somebody and your kid comes up and starts tapping you and interrupting you over and over and over. And pretty soon they interrupt you enough that you tell somebody, hey, can you hold on a second? And you address your kid and then you go back to where you are, pick it up, generally where the conversation is and then your kid's gone or whoever interrupts you is gone. And so that allows you to emulate multitasking when in fact you're not. You're using time slicing to try to handle multiple things. Now people say, hey, I, I can multitask. No, we don't multitask. We actually use time slicing because it's really hard for humans to do that. So you'll concentrate on something. You may stop, turn your attention to another task and come back, but you're not doing them at the same time. So again, this interrupt comes in and it says to the CPU, I need your attention. Now, the interrupts are generally the lower the interrupt, for instance, a mouse. Uh, 
A mouse has a very low interrupt, meaning that when I move my mouse like I need to do here, it gets its attention almost right away because it's such a critical part of using the OS. And it's initiated by a device like a mouse movement or the computer saying, hey, I need access to this memory. And so it tells the OS I need to do this, so it interrupts. So, devices connected to CPU. We have our main memory, our hard drive, our DVD, and remember, all of these uh, processes share these devices. So, if they're connected to the CPU, they're generally going to have a higher interrupt. So, your main memory, your hard disk, your CD-ROM, you want those to have higher uh, interrupts because you need to get information off the hard drive or out of the main memory. You can configure your devices with an environment. So like plug and play. So you plug something in. We take this for gra uh, granted now. Plug a device into your USB and it will go out and it will say here's my address and here's my interrupt. So you might plug in a device that needs to have a higher interrupt on it and it notifies the CPU. The CPU configures it and then the CPU allows that device to go out and actually uh, have that interrupt, higher interrupt, so it can get more attention. Um, it used to be what they call manual jumpers and switches. I mean, you used to have to pull the card out and switch these little dip switches in order for it to work. And then we got really sophisticated and said, okay, we don't need manual dip switches. We can have auto dip switches. However, we have to go set them in the software. And if you forgot your settings, it was possible that you were saying two devices need the same interrupt, which caused a problem and would often cause systems to crash or not to operate effectively. And it was miserable. And that's what a deadlock is. So... Uh, when it says it freezes the system, um, the, it doesn't necessarily freeze it, but what's happening is you've got two competing uh, resources that need the same thing, and the OS goes in, and now it's changed, but it used to be that you had to reboot the system. You know, have you tried turning it off and on again, that sort of thing. OS's now are a little bit more sophisticated and try to handle that, and they may handle it by saying, okay, which device has, you know, been alive longer, or which one has got a higher interrupt, but it goes in and eventually it kind of gets down to it where it may just flip a coin. So managing memory. This used to be such a huge task in MS-DOS. In order to play some games, we used to have to go into what they call the config.sys and add this thing called HiMem in order to free upper memory because DOS had a limitation and there were all kinds of tricks of the trade that we had to do in order to get memory available for these larger programs to run and it was it was such a pain and when Windows 95 came out it helped release that and so now what happens the OS goes out and says hey what memory do I have available um, and load the programs into there oh this program is no longer working let's go ahead and turn that off and let's go ahead and reclaim that memory back for usage so when it loads it from the disk, it puts it into memory, and when it kills it, it takes it out, and it's constantly managing the memory, constantly loading and unloading. It's what they call garbage collection, and its job is to make sure that you have enough memory to run your operating system, excuse me, as well as your programs. And you know, now RAM is relatively cheap, but it used to be RAM was a premium, and if you tried to run too many programs, your system would appear to slow down as the OS was constantly swapping back and forth, and it would load up a mem uh, program from disk into memory and then run it and then unload it so that another program could load and use that space. It was called disk swa swapping or thrashing, and it was horrible. It slowed the system down, and that's not as much of an issue anymore just because we, you know, we have... RAM is cheap sort of thing. But the thing it does, that I talked about earlier, is communicates with the CPU on where to start executing the program. So when you load a program up into the um, hard drive, and then there's a setting in the operating system, so when you double click that, that operating system knows where to tell the CPU to fetch those instructions from on the hard drive or the SSD uh, or CD-ROM, whatever it is, it says start here. And then like a linked list, it points to all the locations of where it is and starts loading that into memory. And let's take a few minutes here on security. Um, security protects memory. There is memory that is the cores only, that the core should only run in, and that is because you don't want unauthorized access to the core, because the core, as you talked, as we've seen here, is so important on running so many things 
So you really don't want any viruses or anybody getting into that core and messing things up. So one of the things it does is it protects its own memory, but outside of that, it ensures that it's, you know, it says here, distributed evenly among competing processes. Well, that depends on the processes. There are ways that you can write programs that say you need more memory or higher uh, priority. But the big thing it does is it allows you to control who has access to your program. For your Windows users, for instance, sometimes when you load a program, it'll come up and ask you if you're, lo or you're installing a program, do you want to install it for all users or this user? Now what you're doing here is if you say only for this user, as that program's loaded up, the OS is also taking note of the security saying only this person can use this program. Therefore, you can't have unauthorized users get into that program. It also manages the permissions for the users at the OS level. So you can have different groups and you can give those groups different access to different files or different programs. And this allows multiple people to use the computer without having to worry about, are they going to get into my stuff? Or are they going to get in when they're not supposed to? And so what will happen is in 3.1, uh, Windows 3.1, that didn't exist. There were no multiple users. Um, you hit Control Alt Delete, and it would tell you to log in. But there's easy ways to bypass it, and then you had free reign to do whatever you wanted. Well, with Windows 95, and then of course with Windows 10 and Linux, you can go in and you can say, you know what? I don't want anybody to be in the Sys32 folder or my Windows folder. I'm going to only lock that down to people in the administrators group, for example. That way people can't go in and do what they're not supposed to do, deleting or removing or renaming files. And so it sets up a what they call a group policy. So instead of having to do every single user has all their own permissions, you can say, I want to set up a group of super users. And so those super users can be these people. So you add a new user, and then you add them to a group, and then it governs the permissions for that group. So a couple of things to understand uh, on this is how the OS works and how basic tasks are executed. And then we, it says basic file management skills. Um, we will go over this section quickly because every single one of us in this class had better have file management skills on a GUI in this day and age. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be kind of in a world of hurt because all of us should be using uh, or have been using computers to some extent and we do our own file management without really thinking about it. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. So we're going to go through this uh, fairly quickly because we talked about this in another chapter in the file structures. So we know that we have, you know, folders, and those folders are tree-like. And remember, for uh, just as a way back in our file structures, it's a binary tree, which gives us fast search capability. Um, so you have a single root and then multiple nodes or leaves onto that. And so with, remember, with a binary search, it allows us to quickly have our search results based on our search. And, and so we're not going to go much in, into that detail more. We've already discussed that. So command line operating, operating systems, don't worry about DOS. We're going to talk about Linux. Linux has a similar structure. You have a main folder. You can have subfolders. You can have sub-subfolders. You can have files and folders, etc. cetera. Um, in the GUI, you have a Windows Explorer for Windows. But uh, Mac and Linux kind of have a similar Windows Explorer through a graphical interface, which a lot of us use now. So here's Windows Explorer, and you can see here on this side you have your drive, you have your folders, this has subfolders. If you click on this folder, there's sub subfolders under here and files generally tell you what the type is and size. This is, everybody's uh, pretty familiar with using this. But for instance, if you go out and, and Ubuntu and do a list command here, you'll notice here that you have um, different um, folders and generally you can tell it's a folder because it's a little bit grayed out where you have a file which is um, in bold but again you look at this this is great for people who need an OS but this is what we're used to using right here so we are not going to, to take a lot of time in here because this doesn't happen anymore this is old school um, but before you used to be able to use a disk, you had to put it into partitions, and you had to say that this partition was used for this operating system. This really isn't done like it used to be done in the old days. So, yeah, to format a disk, you use FDisk. Um, a couple things to note. 
Linux is case sensitive where Windows is not. So if you typed capital F disk here, uh, you wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't work in Linux. It'd say a known command. Um, don't do this at home, everybody. F disk will go out and reformat your disk, and you don't want to do that. Um, just to know that after a disk has been formatted, it rearranges into addressable areas, and then it gives you a basic directory tree. Remember that the uh, boot sectors, what we talked about, are the first sectors that allow us to boot. Um, that's what the, the CMOS looks at when it, uh, or the BIOS, excuse me, basic input output system looks at the boot sectors to start loading the OS. So when you format a disk, then you put the operating system on there and it gets the boot sector ready to start your computer. So again, we're not going to go over this because you shouldn't be formatting disks. Um, to create a file, we all know how to create a file, right? You right click, you say new file, you give it a name. That's how it's done. I mean, there's really nothing more to say about how to do that unless you're doing it from uh, a command line interface. And if so, you're going to use the make folder command. But you always have at the root level, generally in the C drive, you have a main folder. And then everything under that folder um, is called a subfolder. Um, <coughs> you can have nested subfolders way deep. The problem with doing that, though, is you can easily get lost. So you need to watch uh, how many subfolders you can think uh, that you want because you think, oh, man, I've got all these different things. I'm going to create a subfolder and a sub subfolder and so on down the line. It can really get easy to get lost. Notice here in the creating the files that a parent-child structure has unlimited depth. Um, but again, like I was saying, avoid creating more than 10 levels deep. Otherwise, it's just really going to get messy. Um, all the OS gives you the ability to create folders. You can name them accordingly. It's 255 characters. A couple of things to note here. Unix is case sensitive, and that also includes Linux. So if you create a folder called test with a capital T and another one called test with a lowercase t, as far as Unix or Linux, excuse me, is concerned, those are two different folders. Now, because these are a binary tree, and remember in a binary tree, each leaf has to be unique, that if you try to create the same file in a subfolder, for instance, called test, by default, Windows will give you test underscore one, underscore two, etc. If you try to rename it, it will not allow you to say, I'm sorry, you can only have one folder name in this subfolder of the same file. Uh, that helps with binary tree and for searching. So again, we're not going to go over creating folders. We all know how to do this. You can do file, new folder, or what most of us do is right click in the Windows Explorer, say new folder, and then type in the name. To list the contents of a folder, excuse me, I hit my mic. Uh, to hit the contents of a folder, we know how to do this. You can either go out and hit the ls command in DOS, or, or excuse me, in Linux, or in DOS, you can do the dir command. In Windows and Linux, you double click on it and it brings up the files in File Explorer. And again, if you want to look at it, here's all the folders and subfolders if you wanted to go into the command line for that. Renaming files and folders, again, in Windows, you right click, you do rename, or do what they call a slow click, which is click, and then wait a second, click again, and you type the new name of the folder in. Uh, you can do that on a rename command. Um, but with Linux, it's a little bit different. You have to move the directory into a new name. It doesn't have a rename, it has a move command. But again, you know, we all know how to rename folders. Right click, rename. Now, deleting folders, uh, it does say it requires some, some care because if you delete a folder, everything under that folder, whether it, you know, files or subfolders, are also deleted. And we all know that. We've done that. Now, with Windows, if you do that, generally it puts it out to the recycle bin. And that allows you to go out and recover those files. And that's because once you delete a file, and we talked about this before, it goes out to the uh, journal in Windows NT and it says there are no more files this memory where these folders were at and files are now available for re reuse well the way that it happens now is because hard drives are large enough 
you could set a particular portion of your hard drive aside for the recycle bin. The recycle bin gives you a spot to go in and say, you know what, I really don't want to re to delete these files or folders, or I accidentally did, so you can restore them. Uh, Linux has no recovery mechanism built into it. There are utilities that you can use, uh, but you need to be careful when you delete a folder. Generally, when you're going to delete something, the operating system, at least well, with the folder subfolder, it's going to come up and prompt you, do you really want to do that? Um, and then you can use a star if you want. If you could see down here, um, you could see hey star dot exe a dot or a star dot bat. Again, all of these used to be more important when it came down to DOS. So now, what do we do if we want certain files? These wildcards will work in a search. So if you're going to search for files, you can do star.exe that says just give me all the executable files in this directory or subdirectory. So it is important to understand what these are if you're searching for files and folders. So again, deleting files and folders, my recommendation is uh, for Windows is to delete, understand they go into the recycle bin and that they can be recovered, but also know that if you're running out of disk space, you can also right click and empty your recycle bin. But once that's done, you really can't get those folders back. So, to copy a folder, this is really easy. You right click, we can do it a couple of ways. You can do right click in Windows and say copy, and then go to the location, right click and say paste. You can right click your mouse and drag it from one to another and say move to or copy to. You can use a copy or X copy function uh, to move them on the command line, but generally when we're copying folders, um, you're just going to do a drag and drop. So partitioning, formatting, and creating folders. Um, again, we talked about doing uh, uh, this on the disk. Um, you really want to be careful doing this. Um, it says one of the most important skills to learn is optimizing drives into folders. Um, I This is more of an admin function. Generally, on your desktop application or on your desktop OS, you're not going to be doing this, uh, these drives into folders and partitioning your drives and putting those in folders, etc. You're really just going to be using the file and folder structure that you see with uh, File Explorer. So, to move a file, again, drag and drop is what we're familiar with, but you can use the move command. Or right click, do a right drag, drop it to its location, and say copy here, move here, etc. So a couple of last thoughts here before we finish up for the night. Um, again, learning basic OS concepts are essential. I can almost guarantee everybody in this class has already understood the basic OS concepts of folders and how to rename. But what's important is to know what the operating system is, is doing for you. It's doing memory management. It's doing uh, interfaces to the hardware for you. It's loading and unloading your programs. It's doing a lot of things in the background for you. If you really want to get deep into it, then you start looking at C, C++. That's where I recommend you get into advanced study is getting into that lower level. So couple of things before we finish up here. Uh, again, software control center of the computer is the operating system. Without the operating system, you got a hunk of metal sitting there. It's a nice paperweight. It has the kernel. The kernel is loaded up by the BIOS. After it does a post, the BIOS and the ROM goes out and goes to the boot sector and starts loading in the kernel. The kernel starts doing its job. It gets loaded into memory and starts loading in the, the operating system, whether it be other files, whether it be GUI, whatever it needs. It gets it into RAM, gets that core functionality into RAM so that it's able to get all the input, output, all the devices and get ready to be used. It can be single or multitasking most operating systems today are multitasking. Whether it's done by time slicing, whether it's done uh, through uh, scheduling, or whether it's doing it through multi-core and taking a process and running it through multi-cores, you do have multitasking. It's still the CPU is working on one instruction, but it's doing it so fast and it's able to split it up, it appears to be multitasking. Basic tasks is, and this is, I believe, a test question. 
uh, provides a user interface, it manages processes, resources, and when it says resources, remember resources are memory and access into uh, uh, I.O. devices, and the big one is it provides security. There's two different types we talked about, the GUI, which most of us are familiar with, and the command line interface, console, or the command prompt. And lastly, just to finish up here, that interface between hardware elements is done through drivers, which is managed by the operating system. We do plug and play now most of the time. You plug it in, the operating system identifies it, communicates with the device, sets up all the, the, the interfaces, interrupts, whatever it needs in order for that device. And it can also prompt you to go out and download new drivers for it. It's what it does. That is its job. And, and it makes it so much easier now. Like I said, in the old days, we used to have to do a lot of manual configuration, and we don't have to do that anymore. Then we talked a little bit about, uh, oh, sorry, we uh, protect the system from intent and unintended violations, which means security. So you can't have two devices with the same interrupt. Um, so you plug in a device, and you plug in another device. The OS says, hey, we can't compete for the same resources like we used to. And so it keeps your system more stable. And then you can also, when you load up a program, you can load up a program and say, hey, I don't want these people to use my my program, only me. So it provides that security as well. We talked about file management, which is, you know, everybody knows how to do. And so we don't need to go over that again. So that concludes Chapter 9.